Good morning. We're going to wrap up Othello today. Um, if you're not in the classroom, uh, this presentation is going to be a little bit short because in the classroom we'll be doing two of the student presentations. And uh, so we're just going to kind of play it by ear from there. Um, I think as we go through this thing, there are some things where I feel as if I have not quite uh, finished up everything I should here for Othello, but I think there are a lot of things that I can pick up uh, and some other plays and refer back to things that happen in the plot or speeches or other things like that. And we'll just kind of go uh, from there. A uh, quick reminder of stuff that's to come. Uh, Monday, we start Macbeth. Next Wednesday, paper one is due and we're going to continue to Macbeth. Uh, March 5th, uh, the last day before spring break, uh, we will have... Uh, the Macbeth presentations, we'll have the Macbeth quiz, and we'll just kind of go from there. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. But this is kind of how uh, the next two weeks are going to work. I said that I wanted to talk about the uh, wife whore, the harlot, uh, you know, housewife dichotomy. And I think I'll start talking about uh, some of Cassio's lines about Bianca. Uh, all of this comes from when uh, Iago is setting Othello up. Um, he says something loud about Desdemona and then something softer about Bianca. And then Cassio starts talking about Bianca. Notice that there's, uh, he uses this term caitliff. She is a you know, disreputable person. There's this rogue uh, comment uh, when asked about marrying her. Uh, he says that he wouldn't be a customer um, and that he's too smart to do something like that. He calls her a monkey um, and that she is, uh, you know, too much in love with herself. She flatters herself. He's never promised to marry her. In other words, she, because she's a courtesan, is beneath his contempt. He keeps going about how uh, she's a bobble, all right, and then she's something that he's going to laugh at. You see the laugh lines, and then he calls her a fit shoe, which I believe the textbook tells you is a skunk, a perfumed one. In other words, she is beneath contempt. And so all of those times when Othello calls Desdemona a whore, we have to understand that all of the things that Cassio is saying about Bianca come into play there. All of the associations of her being less than human, of a person that we should not consider a full human being, all come into play here as well. I also think that there is kind of a connection between Desdemona and Bianca in how they are defended. Desdemona doesn't really defend herself very much. And in fact, uh, she, you know, is willing to acquit Othello uh, of her murder as, as sort of her last words. And then you'll notice that Othello is calling her a liar, which means she's going to go to hell and says that she had turned to folly, that she was, you know, a whore. It's the word right on the screen, okay? Amelia says she was heavenly true. And notice that Amelia says, you're the blacker devil. Uh, you are a devil. Thou art rash as fire. Notice the dichotomy here between water and fire uh, in that speech. And then notice that Bianca defends herself by saying that the handkerchief that was left in Cassio's room and that he asked her to make a copy of was a minx's token. Um, the person that 
Uh, Cassio is apparently keeping time with. He is a hobby horse. And then I am no strumpet, but of life as honest as you are that thus abuse me. In other words, she is defending herself just as Emilia defended uh, Desdemona and putting all of the blame back on Cassio just the way Emilia rightfully puts the blame on Othello. And I think Bianca here is equally correct as well. And notice, though, that she is also engaged in some of the same sort of behavior as Cassio. The person Cassio is keeping time with, to use a colloquial term from God knows how many years ago, is a minx. All right, is less than human. Is a toy, a hobby horse, less than human. And so the idea of a woman who, you know, sells her, you know, who engages in prostitution or a woman who is untrue is less than human. Okay. Othello's made that claim several times. And it's only Amelia who resurrects her as an angel, not a whore. And Bianca says, I'm not a strumpet. I'm as honest as you are. She defends herself. And I do think there's this interesting thing here as to how we in the 21st century should react to this dichotomy, this human-animal dichotomy, this human-angel dichotomy, this honest-dishonest dichotomy, and whether we should be upset because it exists in the form of of Bianca or Desdemona being seen as less than human, or whether we should be impressed because the two of them fight for their dignity, the two of them fight to defend themselves, uh, or Amelia on Desdemona's behalf here fights to defend herself. And I think it's one of the open questions that we have to look through, and I think I'll probably come back to it when we start talking about Lady Macbeth. The other thing I want to do here is talk about Othello's soliloquy and talk about how I think in some ways it's a lot like the Brutus soliloquy where he talks about, uh, you know, fashion it thus. Othello comes in and talks about the cause. And he's asking the stars to look down, but he noticed that he calls them chaste. The implication is that the chaste stars should not look down on A, a murder, and B, Desdemona, whom he believes has been unfaithful to him. Notice that he wants to not shed her blood. He does not want to scar her white skin. And it seems to me that that indicates a wit, an idea of a way out. And then he goes to his own fashion me thus thing. She must die, else she'll betray more men. Now, the fact of the matter is, he could find a way to grant the divorce. He could find a way to, you know, get out of this marriage and uh, somehow give her, you know, to Cassio and, you know, the some way or another, um, let that marriage happen if he believed that that was truly there, there's no indication that she would necessarily betray more men. But that's his excuse. And then you've got this double meaning of light. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore. And again, talk about reading the punctuation, not the lines I failed there. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. But once put out thy light, thou cunningest pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can give thy light reloom. All right, and I think this is an important thing. He's trying to figure out the idea of he can light the candle again. But once he kills Desdemona, 
he can't bring her back to life. The Promethean heat is an allusion to Prometheus, the titan from Greek mythology who stole fire and gave it to humans. And depending on which version of the Greek myths you have, he may also have created humanity. All right. And as a creator of humanity, uh, I think it's important to understand that he, not Zeus in those versions, was the person who gave humanity life. And so he cannot figure out how to bring people back to life. And so you've got this creation and fire thing united in Prometheus. And then the thing about the rose. And then thou dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. And perhaps I am reading too much into it, but uh, the idea of almost thou hast persuaded me uh, from the Bible when uh, Paul was talking to one of the governors and almost thou hast persuaded me. And then you have this series of kisses and then he goes and commits the murder. And the murder here, I think, is important because there seems to have been enough time to stop. And yet, even though he doesn't, he knows that once he kills her, he can't bring her back to life. And he is almost persuaded to not kill her. He still has to go back, else she'll betray more men. And that is the thing that drives him over the top. Just as in Julius Caesar, fashion it thus. And then making the argument and going, you know, to complete the action, and in, this case, in that case, the assassination of Caesar. To wrap this up, we've got the conclusion of, Cass of Othello killing himself and Cassio calling him great of heart. When we ended Julius Caesar, we kind of had this ending of, you know, everything for this play is done, but we knew that Antony and Octavian were going to have a war and that Anthony was going to lose. We knew there was a sequel coming. Here, we still have Iago alive, although they're going to put him in prison and torture him and whatever all else, and it's going to be enforced. Everything from the Moor gets taken away, so Othello's work is all divided up. He doesn't get to lie in state the way Brutus got to lie in state in Octavius's tent. Uh, but he still gets called great of heart, just as Brutus was called the noblest Roman of them all. Okay? It just seems as if this is a little bit messier at the end, that the characters don't know what to do, and I think we as the audience don't know what to do. We don't know quite how to feel about Othello. Was he a terrible human being? Was he somebody who was just easily deceived and taken advantage of by Iago? Was he somebody who was great of heart and falls into that tragic hero category where he had the one flaw and that flaw brought him down? Caesar ended with this great big huge you know, cataclysmic event that affected the entire world. This one just seems to, tomorrow's another day, and we're just going to keep going. We're going to wrap up all of this stuff, and we're going to keep going. And that too, I think, makes it different than a lot of the other tragedies that have big world-shattering events or events that affect the gods and humans both. Which leads to today's daily writing. Tragedy features a person of high station brought low due to a character flaw. 
does the character Othello, not the play, the character Othello meet that definition and explain. And if you choose to say that he's a tragic hero, be sure to explain his tragic flaw. If you say he's not a tragic hero, give some concrete details. Why not? Okay. I hope to see you Monday and hope everybody has a good weekend. It should be a lot warmer. And I hope everybody's ready for Macbeth because I think it is truly an awesome play.